Bonsoir. I'm Marie Monique Stacco, and I'm the president of the French Institute Alliance Francaise, and your brave souls to have come through the rain, even though it's not very cold, but it is raining. And I'm sure that a number of people will be late, but we'd like to start our last talk in our Sex and Seduction series about how to bring back fireworks in your relationship. And this is something that we're all looking forward to. And um, I'm there with my husband, and I'm going, sure that we're going to learn a great deal, as you as well. This is, as I said, our last talk. This is the third year we have been doing these talks. Um, and it's so exciting to Erika Lumière, our uh, curator of these talks, that she and I are already talking about next year. And uh, of course, next year, we, we have a blank page. She was saying, I wish the people in the audience would tell me what they want for next year. So keep your creative hat on, and uh, you might have some ideas. Erika Lumière has been our curator for these very successful talks. Um, our first talk, I must tell you about the uh, Catherine Rob Grier, who is a dominatrix of France, who came here with her slave, let's say. There was crowds around the block. Um, so we have several topics, and um, it's, been, it's been wonderful. Erika Lumière is a journalist. She writes, she sings, she is amazing, and you have the joy to have her tonight presenting our panelists. So thank you and enjoy the evening. Good evening, my name is Erika Lumière and I'm thrilled to welcome you all to The Art of Sex and Seduction. This is my third year as creator of this series and I'll say it again, this is without a doubt the most fun job I've ever had. It's been a wild month at FIAF the series got off to an exciting start with a rare public appearance by Madame Catherine Robcrier that Marie-Monique mentioned, France's most famous dominatrix. With the help of journalist Tony Bentley and Swedish filmmaker Lena Mannheimer, we got an inside look at the mysterious world of submission and domination. It was a very entertaining evening as Madame talked openly about her life, love, passions, and rituals. It seemed only natural to follow up this conversation by exploring what's been called the most dangerous passion, jealousy. And our program on La Jalousie didn't disappoint. We met notorious pickup artist Neil Strauss, the best-selling author of the game, who seduced us with his own take on jealousy from his, ex from his experiences as a master Lothario, albeit one that has since been reformed, or so he claims. Dr. Gail Saltz and Professor Peter Tuohy also engaged us in a heated discussion about the science and nature of jealousy and ultimately what we can do to channel this potentially destructive emotion into happier and healthier relationships. Which brings us to tonight's topic, Project Passion, How to Rekindle the Spark. I can't tell you that we've saved the best for last because I think all these discussions are fantastic but I can tell you that in the three years we've organized this series of talks about sex and sexuality, this is the number one subject people have asked us to tackle. So why does passion so often burn itself out? To quote Raymond, the writer Raymond Chandler, the first kiss is magic. The second kiss is intimate. The third is routine. But let's not bash marriage. As you'll learn tonight, married couples are having some of the best sex around. They tend to have more frequent sex, more varied sex, and more emotionally and physically satisfying sex than singles. Clearly, when sex sizzles, it can add a great deal to how couples feel about their relationships, as much as a 20% boost in satisfaction, according to one major survey. But when there's no passion, no spark, it can be awful, taking away an estimated 50 to 70% of marital satisfaction. So how do you sustain passion over the course of a long relationship? Is it even possible 
to reinvent your sex life. Let's hear what our panelists have to say about all this as we put passion under the microscope. I'm very excited to introduce some of the leading voices on the topic today who can hopefully enlighten us with their perspectives on excitement, lust, and desire. But please save any questions you have for the end when there will be a short Q&A with the audience, followed by a book signing upstairs in the Tinker Room. First up, it's my great privilege to introduce to FIAF the fabulous Emily Nagoski. Emily Nagoski is the author of Come As You Are. <laughs> Emily is the author of Come As You Are, the surprising new science that will transform your sex life, a New York Times bestseller that's been called a master class in the science of sex. A well-known sex educator on the college lecture circuit, Nagoski is also the wellness education director at Smith College, where she teaches women's sexuality. She has a PhD in, in health behavior with a concentration in human sexuality from Indiana University and a master's degree in counseling with a clinical internship at the Kinsey Institute Sexual Health Clinic. She is the author of three guides for goodinbed.com, including a scientific guide to successful relationships, and she writes the popular sex blog, thedirtynormal.com. Welcome, Emily. Next, I'd like to welcome back one of our favorite sex therapists, Dr. Ian Kerner. Ian Kerner is a nationally recognized psychotherapist specializing in sexuality and relationships. He is also the New York Times bestselling author of numerous books, including the classic She Comes First. He writes a popular column for CNN and can often be seen on the Today Show and Dr. Oz. Dr. Kerner is also the founder of GoodInBed.com, a publishing company and sexuality think tank. In addition to maintaining a private practice, he is a staff therapist and faculty member at the Institute for Contemporary Psychotherapy. Welcome, Dr. Kerner. Thank you. We're also thrilled to have our, as our next guest, Robin Rinaldi, who flew all the way from California to be with us here tonight. Robin Rinaldi is a journalist who's written for numerous publications, including the New York Times and O Magazine. She's been featured on Dr. Oz, The Meredith Vieira Show, Dr. Drew, and BBC Radio. Her new erotic memoir, The Wild Oats Project, One Woman's Midlife Quest for Passion at Any Cost, chronicles her open marriage experiment and what she learned after a year of sexual abandon in which she let desire call the shots. Welcome, Robin Rinaldi. And finally, joining these speakers, we are very lucky to have as our moderator tonight, Dr. Sari Locker. <laughs> Dr. Sari Locker is an adjunct professor of psychology and education at Columbia University Teachers College, where she teaches developmental psychology of adolescents. Dr. Locker is also a well-known sexuality educator and author of four books, including The Complete Idiot's Guide to Amazing Sex. She hosted Late Date with Sari, talk show on Lifetime TV, and she was a reporter for CBS TV News. She's a frequent guest on TV programs, including Today, Good Morning America, Conan O'Brien, NBC Nightly News, Dr. Oz, CNN, Fox News, and MTV. Dr. Locker is a graduate of Cornell University and has an MS from the University of Pennsylvania and an MA and PhD from Columbia. Welcome, Dr. Sari Locker. Let's give a warm welcome to all our speakers. Thank you. Passion, lust, sexual desire. We hear these words and they conjure up images in our minds. Sometimes we think about movie scenes. I've been thinking about a scene I read in a novel, Fates and Furies by Lauren Groff. She writes about newlyweds on the sand in the, at the beach making love. And she says that it doesn't matter that the sand was rough. They were down on their knees, reduced to hands and mouths. Very sexy. That's sexual desire. We know it when we read it. We know it when we see it. And best of all, we know it when we feel it. But when we don't feel it, when the desire feels like something we don't even remember, the definition of sexual desire becomes elusive. So let's start with defining what is sexual desire. 
Emily, just. So the, the example of they were reduced to hands and mouths, when I hear that, what I hear is not so much desire as sexual pleasure and enjoying. Um, if we were any species other than humans, we'd be talking in terms of sexual proceptivity, the eagerness of an organism to pursue a sexual connection instead of pursuing all the other things that the organism could be pursuing, like food and childcare and running away from predators. To decide to prioritize and make the pursuit of sex your priority is a kind of sexual desire, but then there's the where you have, you're sitting there and all you can think about is how much you want to put your tongue down that person's throat. Uh, and I think when we think about sexual desire in a non-technical sense of being like monkeys, what we're talking about is that sort of like cognitive and emotional place of that there, I want that, of the wanting. And one of the difficulties with wanting is you can't want a thing you have. You can enjoy a thing you have. You can enjoy the heck out of it. I was going to say another word. Um, but you can only want a thing that is at a distance. So sexual desire then isn't possible for someone you're close to? Yeah, if you make up rules, one of the first things that happens, I'm sure Ian can talk about this more than I can, but uh, in my clinical internship at Kinsey, one of the first rules you give a couple when they're seeking sex therapy is you're not allowed to have sex with each other. Um, and very often the first thing that happens is a couple who hasn't had sex in six months will come back and say, we haven't had sex in six months, but last week we had sex three times. Just because you told them they weren't allowed to. <laughs> like teenagers. So, Ian, what do you think? Well, I mean, it is true we often do tell couples to take sex off the table with this hope that um, they can kind of reinvent their sex script. You know, one thing that I was thinking about when you brought up the question, uh, sorry, is uh, I spend a lot of time these days actually um, educating and teaching couples therapists about sex therapy. I don't know how many of you have ever been to a couples therapist in here, if you want to raise your hand. Go ahead. Uh, and how many of you have ever tried to bring up sex with a couples therapist? Um, but couples therapists will often avoid the topic of sex. And so you end up colluding in a lot of science, uh, in a lot of silence. And one thing that when you talk to couples therapists is they seem to think that if you have a great, solid, secure attachment, <laughs> that that's enough. And that that is going to generate an interest in sex, it's going to generate great sex, it's going to generate desire, and um, it just doesn't work that way. And so I think as a society, I think we, as a culture, I sometimes think we feel like, well, if we just can fall in love and find our soulmate and have this lovely, comfy, cozy, secure relationship that sex is going to happen from there. And so I think desire is what we start to layer on top of that attachment. I think the attachment is actually incredible. And I think if you can have that secure, safe attachment, I mean, then it's really the Wild West and an open frontier from there. But it's really about what you start to layer on top and, and how you build up from there. And that's kind of the work that I do with uh, my couples. Robin, you were married. Mm -hmm. Spoiler alert for those who haven't read your book yet. I <laughs> yeah. said were married. Yeah. <laughs> Had been married. Mm -hmm. When you were married, you felt a lot of sexual desire. Mm -hmm. What did it feel like? While we're still defining it, what was it that you felt? Well, I, I, I think we use, I have used that word to mean a couple of different things. It can mean wanting something from afar. It could be wanting to reconnect to someone you're already close to and have the attachment to. Um, in my case, I think we all know desire when we feel it. You know, it's a, it's a yearning. It's a feeling that uh, you want something you don't have or some feeling you don't have, someone or some feeling with a certain someone. Um, in my case, I, I really explored desire from a couple different angles because I turned 40 and started in the, for the first time in my life to want to have a child. And it kind of came on late. And when it comes on that late, as a lot of women, I think, can attest, it comes on urgent and strong because there's not much time left. Um, and then when that didn't happen in my marriage, that desire kind of snaked its way and kind of sublimated its way into uh, this desire for sexual adventure. But if I look at both of those as a whole, I think what I was looking for is something new. I feel like. It doesn't even have to be a new person. I wanted a new experience. 
a new moment, a fresh moment where you feel alive. I think that is a very big part of when we say we desire. Um, I think Emily calls it in her book for advancing the script or advancing the storyline. Advancing the plot. Advancing the plot, yeah. We want I read to, a lot of romance novels. We want to advance the plot. We want something to happen, something new. Well, it seems like there are these key points in life where sexual desire can wane. So let's talk about that. What do you think are those key times? Well, you know, I just want to make one, one quick comment because as, as uh, Robin was speaking, you know, I thought of this line by uh, the French filmmaker Jean-Luc Godard who said, all stories have a beginning, middle, and an end, but not necessarily in that order. <laughs> and when we think about desire, I guarantee that every one of us in here thinks of desire as something that happens at the beginning that gets the plot going, that gets the ball mm -hmm. rolling. And you'd be shocked to, to know that in a lot of ways, for a lot of couples, for a lot of people, desire may come in the middle of the story. It's not necessarily the first thing that gets the ball rolling. Desire may come at the very end and be the setup for future sex. Well, here's one time when it probably doesn't come. It probably doesn't come after a couple has a child. Mm -hmm. Usually, that's one of the times when sex is not so hot in a relationship. Do you hear that often too? Yeah, so I was standing in the back being like, oh, and here's Ian quoting Jean-Luc Godard and talking about these artists. I'm like, I'm gonna talk about neuroscience, sorry. I'm just, I'm gonna talk about brain science. So um, in the middle of your brain, I call it the one ring. There's this one batch of brain organs that manages all of your emotions simultaneously. And sex is competing with all those other emotions and all those other physiological demands. And when you have a baby, first of all, um, if you're the birth parent of the child, then your the entire meaning of your body has changed. The relationship you have with your body has changed. So of course the relationship with you have your sexuality has changed. But then on top of that, you're massively sleep deprived. All of the emotional dynamics in your relationship have completely and fundamentally changed. And you really, and your body might even be lactating and producing food, which changes the entire nature of what your breasts look like, how they feel, and what they mean in your relationship. So yeah, things change. And normalizing that like for a little while, sex is gonna drop lower on your priority list. And doesn't that make perfect sense? The same thing, I talked this morning with someone who said, I just finished my PhD, top of my list right now, have a little sex. <laughs> There are just times when it isn't the main thing. Um, one of the, John Gottman cites this research that shows that couples who sustain uh, strong sexual connections over multiple decades have two things in common. One, they have a strong friendship at the foundation of their relationship, and two, they prioritize sex. They decide that spending time with their skins next to each other matters, and they choose to do that instead of spending time with their children or their families or watching Game of Thrones. And so, Robin, for you, it wasn't having a child. It was not having a child that made you want to feel, yeah, which more is ironic, right? Because uh, so I wanted a child, and then that kind of got hindered, and then I felt all boxed in, and I said, okay, well, if I'm not going to have a child, I want sexual adventure, and it's strange. Uh, people have a hard time understanding it, and I un and I get why. Uh, because if I had had a child, <laughs> sex would have probably gone away for a while and my marriage would have, you know, become even more staid and stable and quiet, you know, for raising the child. So what did you do? Uh, so I uh, had a midlife crisis and told uh, my husband I wanted to initiate an open marriage. Okay, I need to tell you, first of all, I don't call it a midlife crisis, I call it a midlife opportunity. So, <laughs> you had a midlife opportunity. Okay, if you want to. And your husband that. agreed that you would have an open marriage. Yeah, so I basically, I just, it's kind of one of those second chance things where I was kind of cautious my whole life, monogamous my whole life, and um, good everything kind of, yeah, it. good girl syndrome. So everything kind of came kind of crashing out uh, in my early 40s when this happened. What did you do? Um, I moved out and got um, a series of apartments. Of course, this was in San Francisco, which you know kind of explains the way the plot goes a little bit. Um, but I, uh, we we had an open marriage during the week, and then we lived together on weekends. So it was kind of a part-time open separation marriage thing. Um, and during the week, we were free to see other people and um, explore and do a kind of, we kind of set it up that way so that 
we could try to maybe weather this storm without all of the, um, you know, the stuff that goes along with affairs. Okay, so it worked for you in well, some it, way? Well, it worked for me in, uh, I mean, I think I, it's what needed to happen. There was, a, there was maybe some biological drives behind it, some deep psychological drives behind it. I'm pretty honest in the book that I don't think all the psychological drives were pretty. There was probably some childhood leftover crap in there behind it. Um, but, I, you know, it's what, it is what had to happen, and, uh, you know, it, my marriage didn't survive it, but, uh, you know, the two people survived it. And, you know, a lot of people have said to me, why would you think an open marriage would save your marriage? And I have to back up and say that I wasn't really doing it to save my marriage. I was doing it at that point to save myself, to mm -hmm. save something in my soul, and hopefully try to preserve the marriage. It was one of the times when I you know, prioritize self over marriage, which is a tightrope that all marriages have to walk kind of every day. This was in a dramatic way. And Ian, when you work with couples who are having issues with their sex life, whether it's because they have a new child mm -hmm. or because they didn't have a child and they feel stuck in, mm -hmm. in this situation even without a child, would you ever advise them to seek sex outside the marriage? Um, in some cases where two individuals may have a little bit of a sexual thrill-seeking temperament, mm -hmm. and they sort of share that in common. Um, it's interesting, you know, sometimes, uh, I mean, my wife and I, what we share in common is that we're sort of like uh, comfort creatures when it comes to sex. We like same bed, sort of same time, same few sex scripts, it just kind of works for us. And sometimes you meet people who are really tuned at the thrill-seeking end of the spectrum mm -hmm. as well, and they really have a, a thirst for adventure and wildness. A lot of the issues that I end up dealing with is when the sort of the thrill of infatuation wanes and you're no longer under the influence of this neurochemical cocktail, you kind of realize, wow, I'm sort of a comfort creature, you're kind of a thrill seeker, I'm here, you're here, can we meet here in the middle? Um, and that ends up being um, really difficult, um, complicated work. And before I would advise anyone to um, actually go out and do something, well, can I give you, can I take my five minutes and give you a little case study, like yeah, a little please. tiny snapshot of a couple that you just reminded me of? So I was working with this couple. They had not been having sex. They were in a sex rut. He felt that he was much more sexually adventurous than his wife and that she was much more closed off and they were arguing a lot. And one of the main issues that they had was that um, he really wanted to have a threesome. Like he was kind of hell bent on a threesome and she just thought that he was sort of a pig and she wanted to hear nothing of it. Um, she had actually had a threesome herself when she was in college, which was sort of a coercive experience that she really did not look fondly on. And they would argue and argue and argue about it. And one thing that I did in my practice, in my office was, I said, let's just create a space where we can, we can talk about this and just talk about the fantasy, talk about what's in it, just take a deep breath and have a nice conversation about it. And so finally we kind of cooled down the temperature in the room and he started to talk about his threesome fantasy. And it turned out Wait, that she- Are you gonna she, give us a little details what, there? Well, Come on. it turned out <laughs> that she was really featured very heavily in his oh, fantasy. Nice. And that like his fantasy really involved like her being pleasured by multiple hands and multiple mouths. And she kind of like, it kind of blew her away that like she was like the star of this show. Um, you know, and they left. <laughs> so they left and they came back and they had had some really amazing sex just because they had talked about this fantasy. And I swear so many couples just will not even share a kinky fantasy. And there's this gulf between them. So just, they didn't have to go out and have a threesome, but just talking about it. Now what's interesting is they did decide to take it, not to necessarily, I don't know, maybe they did take it all the way, but what happened to them next was, and this was very spontaneous, they went out and for fun, they would identify people that they were willing to have threesomes with. And she would identify women that she'd be willing to bring in the bedroom, but she made him identify men that he'd be willing to, and in his fantasy never involved men, and so that opened up this whole fluidity thing, and it really got them <laughs> even thinking more expansively. Then they began to go out and actively, consciously flirt with people. All right, okay? now only fun 
if they're very secure in themselves, which many people aren't. But, but the first part of their story, I think, gives us a sense of the range. So some people might uh, make their sex life more exciting by having sex outside of the relationship. Others might just talk about their fantasies in a way that feels safe. And they, they experience some different things along this continuum. But there are lots of different ways to spice up a relationship that don't necessarily mean taking it outside of the relationship. Emily, want to jump in? I totally want to talk about the brain part. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so with the uh, individual differences in sexual temperaments, the brain mechanism underlying that, and a lot of individual differences in personality have uh, underlying stuff happening in the brain. So some people are really super sensitive. Like when you were a kid growing up, the tag in your clothes was just unbearably annoying, and your parents would have to like, cut out all the tags and everything. So you're a person who's really sensitive, and that's reflected in the amount of neurochemical that's released in your emotional brain when you experience sensations. Some people are super intense. And so like they experience their emotions in a way that fills up the room and other people experience their emotions in a way that's contained within their body. And that's reflected in the amount of neurochemical that's released at the time that you're experiencing the emotion. In the same way, um, the sexual response mechanism in the brain is a two-part mechanism. It's called the dual control model. Uh, one is a sexual accelerator or gas pedal, and the other is a sexual brake. And we both have these all the time, responding to sexually relevant stimulation, responding to all the good reasons not to be turned on right now. And the process of becoming aroused is this dual process of turning on all the ons and turning off all the offs, and there's individual variability in the sensitivity of these. It's a normal bell curve, so most of us are heaped up in the sort of normal average range, but there are folks who, if they have a really sensitive accelerator, or are on the sensitive side of, with their accelerator, are gonna be more prone to wanting novelty and adventure and risk, whereas people with less sensitive accelerators are gonna be less interested in that, and people with sensitive brakes are gonna be super not interested in that, and those are the folks who are more prone to sexual dysfunction, all desire, arousal, and orgasm. Um, uh, usually we think of sexual problems as being about not enough stimulation to the gas pedal, it's very often too much stimulation to the break. And that's cultural stuff, and it's biological health stuff, and it's do I trust my partner, and it's am I allowed to want these things, that sort of self-monitoring. Mm -hmm. I think the, one of the biggest questions that, that we get in the sex education, sex therapy field, is am I normal? Any variation of the am I normal question. And already we're learning that there are lots of different things that are normal in this range. So when you mentioned the couple who's comfortable having sex, in the same positions, the same way, in bed at night. That may have been really eye-opening for a lot of people here because people think that if their sex life isn't over-the-top exciting, like what they read about in Cosmo or what they see in, in a movie, then their sex life isn't good mm -hmm. enough. So can people really be satisfied with a sex life that is just what they're accustomed to? Some people can be, and that's okay. One of the things that I have gotten really excited about talking about, I don't know how we've gotten to this place as a culture where how much we crave or have an urgent kind of like internal, I want sex, like we somehow have taken desire and made that the center of our definition of sexual well-being, um, which is weird because it's like how dissatisfied I am with the amount of sex I'm having is how I can tell that I'm healthy. <laughs> Doesn't make yeah. a lot of sense if you sit and think about it rationally, but, so what I've been suggesting is that people put pleasure at the center of their definition of sexual well-being and allow the desire, the like, oh, I want that to emerge in response to how much you like what's going on. So if comfort sex is what works in your relationship every Friday, 8 o'clock, you and me and the red underwear, and you just, like, you just know, and it's like really comforting to know that your partner's always there for you, is always going to touch you in this way that feels really safe and reassuring and good, if you like it, you're doing it right. And I can attest to that personally because, I mean, here I had all this hunger, right? All mm. of this dis desire, which, which does on some level feel like dissatisfaction. When you want something, it's something you don't yet have. And yet when I went out and started acting on all of this, I can, and I write about this explicitly in the book, that very often it was, there was kind of this psychological need that was getting um, mm. satiated, like, oh, I, I'm adventuring, now I'm adventurous. See, I'm an adventurous person. And, uh, you know, I'm fulfilling this part of me that's unlived. And I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't call all of it pleasurable or necessarily enjoyable. So there's a definite difference between desire and enjoyment. Let's also talk about the difference between desire and arousal. Can somebody not feel desire for the partner and just, jump into having sex 
because they want to have sex in their life? Well, Tell me a little bit about that. Sure, I mean, um, I talk to, when I work with my couples all the time, um, I tell them, you know, first of all, sex begets sex, sex ruts begets sex ruts, and sometimes you really do have to put your body through the motions and, and sort of put, put your body through the motions and trust that your mind or your brain will follow. Sometimes you really do have to, and this is as, as much true, it's certainly true for women, but I find it's also true for yes. men who are experiencing low desire. And a lot of men, um, you know, I mean, there's just, uh, for, for a lot of people, there's just so much, so many demands upon us between digital distractions of life, between work and kids, between the distractions of, of pornography um, that, um, you know, just a lot of us are just running low on the tank when it comes to desire. And so I think that there is this idea now that um, you kind of just have to start generating arousal, that arousal really comes uh, before desire, and if you just, again, it's sort of like, remember that commercial that always used to be like, try it, you'll like it. When was that? <laughs> that was like in like the yeah. 70s or something, yeah. right? Yeah. Try it, you'll like okay. it. Okay, so if he says, honey, let's do it tonight, and she says, by do it, you mean watch Netflix, right? <laughs> <laughs> and she totally isn't in the mood, should she go ahead and do it anyway? What do you think, Emily? I think the right framework is uh, to be like, so, I'm interested. I figure maybe we put our beds in the body and like let our skins touch and see, you know, cuddle and kiss. And if it goes somewhere, great. And if it doesn't go somewhere, we've still done something both of us liked. Like, well, where's the heart? But what if there's disappointment and resentment because it didn't go any further? Yeah, so what is it that you want when you want sex? When you mentioned porn in particular, um, and what is it when you were having these experiences, what is it you actually want? Do you actually want to touch and be affectionate with your partner, because you got that. Or did you want an orgasm? You could probably, if you'd be like, this feels really good and I'm, I'm sort of done, well, would it be okay with you if I masturbate while you're here? Like, like, let that be a way that your connection happens? Or is what you wanted to perform sex the way you're pretty sure you're supposed to be having it? Or you used to be having it. Yeah. yeah. Like That's we were, the complication, yeah. I think. Yeah. 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 Or you used to be having it with some other Right. So it's so. What is it actually? What, what do you actually want when you want sex? I think is the question. If right. it's anything other than something both of you have agreed on, then it's time for a conversation. There's so many assumptions when we get into bed, uh, whether it's with a long-term partner or a one-night stand. There's there's every both people I think come into bed with stories in their head and a script um, and a motivation, and they're often unspoken. Even in a long-term couple, they're often unspoken, and I think. Um, I mean, it sounds boring, but I really think airing, you know, speaking that is, is key. Well, and sorry, you mentioned that you asked about the difference between desire and arousal. And you know, Masters and Johnson, who viewed 10,000 acts of sex and developed sort of the uh, archetype for our model of human sexual response, which has been modified in a lot of different interesting ways, but at its core still has some really great fundamentals, they never used the term desire. They began with the term excitement. And in viewing 10,000 acts of sexual response, when you look at it laid out on a graph, for men and women, it kind of goes like this very quickly. And then for men, it kind of goes up here and down like that, orgasm and down here. And for women, it goes up quickly, and it can either go to orgasm and then sort of come down a little bit with the potential to maybe go up again, or it may get up to here and then sort of just go like this without ever getting to orgasm. But the point I'm trying to make is that across the model, it goes like that. It gets up pretty far. And how are you gonna continue to do that as a couple week after, day after day, week after week, year after year? Now Masters and Johnson also discovered something interesting too, that especially for women, some of them could think their way to orgasms and that the value of psychological or psychogenic stimulation was huge in creating arousal. Sure, you can touch your genitals, you touch them long enough and something will happen, but the sex that really turns us on is not the sex that's coming into physical contact with us, it's the sex we're thinking about, it's the sex we're seeing, dreaming about, fantasizing, looking at, smelling, it's the sex that's coming through our senses. And I think for couples that are stuck in ruts, that can't get up that hill anymore, there's no, there's really not, there's no psychological stimulation. They haven't developed the vocabulary. There's a, a webcomic called Oh Joy Sex Toy by an artist named Erica Moe, and she illustrated my book, 
she and I are sex educator married, um, and she <laughs> reviews sex toys in her comic, and she just reviewed one called, ugh, it's called The Womanizer, sorry. <laughs> But what it does, it's not a vibrator, it's, it's a suction thing. So you put it over your clitoris and it sucks on your clitoris. And she had orgasms really easily, but she actually said it was really disappointing and unsatisfying because the orgasm happened too fast. And she didn't get enough like buildup and stimulation and pleasure. So it was just like this sort of pulsing, very limited right here in her clitoris and the rest of her body wasn't involved at all. So having it take longer expands the pleasure. So sometimes, like allowing there a slow burn actually improves not just the quality of the experience that you personally have, but the way that you're engaged with your partner too. You know, there's been a medicalization of sex, particularly lately, um, a new medication on the market for women that's supposed to bring them arousal. Of course, Viagra for men. I'd love to hear- No, it doesn't bring them arousal though. No. I'm sorry. <laughs> Can I? Go I ahead. I have feelings about that's this. That's what I'm saying. It's so the yeah. people have been saying okay. it and it certainly doesn't. Um, what it does is it plays with their brain chemistry. Yeah. I will let you explain, Emily. Jump in. Oh, okay. And let's also talk about Viagra, too. You want to divide this up on gender lines? You take the female medications. Technically, that's sex them. lines. Because <laughs> gender is the mask. It doesn't matter. So, okay. So, here's the, so it's called pink Viagra. It's not Viagra. I'll let Ian explain that. But basically, it's a drug that messes with your neurochemicals. Over a period of four to eight weeks, it builds up in your system and gradually is supposed to increase your spontaneous, out of the blue, kaboom, desire for sex. Erica illustrates it as a lightning bolt to the genital. So for me, it's always kaboom. I would like to get some sex. Spontaneous desire as opposed to emerging from pleasure. Um, and here's the thing. The FDA analysis of the data found that 10% of the women on the drug experienced at least minimal benefit which means that 90% of the women on the drug experience not even minimal benefit. Two, uh, average uh, women on the drug experienced one additional sexually satisfying event per month above placebo. It's a drug you take every day. Three, this is a drug with side effects that are potentially so serious that providers are required to go through a special training and certification process before they're allowed to prescribe it. So you can have one sexually satisfying event per month. In sex therapy, that one sexually satisfying event is your homework. So one, the drug doesn't work, but two, when you hear people interviewed, and that you, of course you interviews with people who've had a really good experience on the drug, uh, what they say is, once we got started, everything was fine. It was getting me started that was the hard part. Or I really felt like I had to rev myself up. And here all of us have been talking about how creating a sexy context and allowing desire to emerge from the connection between you and your partner, allow it to emerge from pleasure, is the definition of a sexually satisfying relationship, especially in the long term. Okay, so the female medication, which the brand name is? Flibanserin. And they're that's calling the it drug name. Oh, it's that's the drug Addy name. Addy is the. Addy. Oh, okay. with, with an A D D Y I. Addy, yeah. yeah. It's supposed to affect desire, not arousal. Right. And, and it's sold the day after the FDA approval for a billion dollars. Right. And you yes. don't recommend it. Well, it doesn't <laughs> work, to, to say it mildly. OK. Um, Viagra is supposed to affect arousal, mm -hmm. not desire. Mm -hmm. So it gives the man the firm erection, and that would make him in the mood for sex. Yeah, well, it's interesting with uh, flibanserin, its success, it had been rejected time and time again, but they put millions into an and it's sort of an insidiously brilliant marketing God, campaign, brilliant. which was, they made it an issue about feminism, which was to say, men get Viagra, it's unfair that women aren't getting their pill to uh, increase yeah. arousal, right? I mean, that was sort of it the linchpin of how they, stunning. and they got feminists, was, right? Some pretty remarkable feminists. The National come, Organization of Women, for crying out loud. Susan Scanlon. To come out and, you know, characterize it that way. Um, so should couples, so you're saying you don't think couples should go near that medication if the woman is having an issue. Should they try Viagra? Does that help? Well, I work with, um, so I work with a lot, I mean, the number one issue I probably deal with in my practice is uh, our desire discrepancy issues, low desire, no desire, mismatch libido. And then the second set of issues that really comes up are um, um, orgasm problems, premature ejaculation, uh, erectile disorder, and uh, increasingly, um, you know, the types of erectile disorder that I'm coming across are um, situationally based, psychologically mm. based. They're not so much organically based. And so, uh, you know, if you have, listen, if you're of a certain age, um, if your health and lifestyle is of a certain quality, 
you may really benefit from Viagra. But and it not can so much, really be. Sorry, not uh, so much for people who aren't in the mood, though. More for men oh, who just can't get it. Absolutely. I mean, well, that's the thing, too, is that Viagra really affects arousal. And listen, there is something to be said for you pump some blood to the genitals, you give a guy an erection, he will want to use it. So there is a correlation <laughs> between arousal and desire. However, Can a I lot of men who go on, desire, go on Viagra to deal with desire issues inev inevitably go off it okay. very quickly. I have a friend who is in his 60s and he had had uh, heart issues and his erections, you know, change. You get older, your testosterone levels change, your erections change. He literally called me the first time he took Viagra, because he was so excited to have this erection that pointed toward the ceiling like it did when he was in his 20s. He was like, Emily, this is amazing. So it, it, increasing blood flow has an impact on people's lives. Oh, sorry. Uh, but generally, there's no magic pill. We can go ahead and say that. Which leaves us back to the drawing board, to some extent, uh, about what couples should do. And let's springboard on what you just said about aging. Aging is the greatest factor with passion and desire decreasing. Uh, there are women who are under the age of 45, about 10% say that they have low sexual desire. Women over the age of 60, about 50% say that they have low sexual desire. So it's a huge difference that occurs sometime for women, maybe around menopause, but not necessarily related to it. What the research shows is that there's not a direct relationship with any hormonal anything, um, but there is a relationship with relationship duration. Uh, but the thing is, so it's not, so if a woman's in her 60s and she got divorced three years ago and she falls the fucking love, she may have felt like her sexual desire was gone and yet all of a sudden there's somebody who finds her really, really hot and she finds that person really, really hot. It turns out her sex drive was really just fine. It was context dependent and very often what has changed is not the love or satisfaction in the relationship, uh, not any hormone or biological things, but you've just, like, the context has changed. So the way your brain is responding to sexual stimulation has changed. So what, that gives you a lot of control and a lot of options. You look at, so what is it in our relationship that's hitting the accelerator and what are, that we can, like, tune into and increase and what are the things we can turn off on the brakes, like what's getting in our way. So when you control the context, you can change the, sex, the way people are experiencing sexual desire. And even the people who are experiencing what they call low desire, very often have what the women taking the drug had, which is responsive desire. It's not that it's low, it's that it emerges in response to pleasure rather than spontaneous desire, which emerges in anticipation of pleasure. It's basically having a really low threshold for sexual stimulation. You just have sort of a sexy thought and your body's like, that's a good idea, we should do that. <laughs> so that's spontaneous desire and it's the narrative we've all been told, but then responsive desire is also normal, where what it takes is your certain special someone kind of come over and like kissing on the thing and the sweet nothings and you're like, oh, that feels, that feels really nice. And you start making out with your person, you're like, oh, that feels actually really good. How, you know what, how about maybe some sex? <laughs> that's responsive desire and it is equally normal. But a woman might experience, anybody might experience themselves as being low desire because they didn't crave it before it started. And I love that your example was a 60-something-year-old woman because it goes back to this point that people are sexual their entire lives from womb to tomb, as we say, and it can come at any age. Yeah. And as a 51-year-old, I, I, I'm going to uh, take a guess that it's not just hormones, maybe it's not hormones at all, that starts to change your sexual functioning and desire, but it has a lot to do with a woman's body image as a woman ages, and mm. probably a man's too. I mean, we really have bombarded messages about what we're supposed to look like, and you know, as you age, you can't really control that anymore. And that has a big effect in bed. There was a, a great research study that came out in the Journal of Sex Research a couple months ago, and the title of the study was Feeling Frumpy, the Relationship <laughs> Between Body yeah. Image and Sexual Response Changes in Midlife Women. The study found that when a woman perceived herself as less than attractive, I'm sorry, as less attractive than she had been earlier in her life, then her sex life, her sexual desire had declined after menopause. So it was mm -hmm. all about how she perceived herself, well, at least the correlation in this study, but I love that feeling frumpy. Feeling mm -hmm. frumpy. I, but, I, go ahead. I was just had a funny little anecdote. Uh, about six months ago, I was working with a 45-year-old woman and she was incredibly upset about her sex life because she had walked in on her 70-year-old parents having sex. 
And she's like, I'm so depressed because my mother is having more sex than me, <laughs> and it's just not fucking fair. And so we said, well, what does mom have going on that maybe you don't have going on in your life right now? Well, mom doesn't have two teenagers that she's raising. Um, mom is exercising a lot. Mom has a little more disposable income. Mom isn't on Facebook, Instagram, <laughs> and a bunch of social media. And so instead of being mad at mom or upset about it, maybe take a page from mom's book about clearing out some of that clutter. I think and we found the culprit. It's um, social media. Social media is the culprit, yeah. And absolutely, I think also she should be thrilled knowing that her future can be as bright as her mother's. <laughs> Uh, we have a little bit more time to talk. What I'd love to do in the rest of our time is really come up with some tips, some things that will help people in the audience. We know we have people at all different phases of life, all different issues. And what are some tips that you can offer uh, for whichever age group you want to talk about or whatever tips you think are most important? Who wants to start? When you mentioned the study, the okay. one I thought of was published last year. Uh, so it was relationships of all gender configurations. The single best predictor of sexual satisfaction was not what they did, how often they had sex, how many orgasms they had. The single best predictor was how long they cuddled <laughs> after the sex. So when I read that, I was like, that's really interesting. And I wrote about it. And then I tried it with my husband. And it totally worked. We didn't change anything else. We like, I would set it, so this is being married to me. I set a timer. <laughs> we had to cuddle for at least 15 minutes every time. And we usually cuddled way past the 15 minutes. And the like sense of warmth and affection between us was like, it just got, so I highly recommend, even if you're having mediocre sex, have awesome cuddling afterward. <laughs> and it will really have, not that the sex we have is mediocre, sorry, honey. It's fabulous. <laughs> but increase your cuddling. You want to? No, please. Uh, uh, yeah, what were some of the adventures that really did it for you, and do you recommend them to other people? Well, I mean, uh, overall, I would, if you want the adventures, you'll have to buy the book. But overall, <laughs> um, I would say that. Uh, and I'm definitely the layperson in this group. You guys are all the experts. You're like, how to do it right. And I'm like, how to go off the rails. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I will say that uh, a theme throughout my um, adventure and, that I think is, is a healthy one is really listening to your body. Mm. Uh, I think we have so many stories from childhood, from the media, from everywhere floating around in our heads about what sex should look like, what your relationship should look like, what you should look like, especially if you're a woman. Um, it, it takes a certain number of years and experience and real effort to kind of drop into your body and really listen to what it's saying. Um, you know, if I had to give a tip, I'd really say to, um, to, to walk up to your partner um, and just say to your partner, you know, I last night I had the craziest, sexiest dream about you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and let me just, you know, tell you about it. And then fill in the blanks with something really um, fun, interesting, <laughs> kinky, and get that uh, psychological stimulation going. And a book that I often recommend, it's one of my favorite books. I give it to couples, I Xerox chapters. It's by a, a therapist who's, who's now recently deceased named Jack Marin, and it's called The Erotic Mind. I don't know if any of you have read mm -hmm. it. But he really, um, he really sort of breaks down arousal, but he has this idea that as people, we have core erotic themes that go back to our childhoods, that they're playing on essential psychological themes, and they, mm -hmm. they bubble up as these fantasies. And the book is sort of a, an, ex, an explanation and also a workbook to help you sort of get in touch with your core erotic themes. And then if you're sharing fantasies that really are going back to your core, then that becomes the context, the thing that holds it all together. So it doesn't just seem like some random thing you want to try. It's really connected to something that's psychologically deep. Mm -hmm. That was a really good one. Okay. <laughs> I thought you were going to mention Jack's other book. So, no. Uh, so, Erotic Mind is, well, I have and a anal giant anal <laughs> note in my book about like the neuroscience of the four components of erotic fantasies. I won't talk about it now, but yeah, Erotic Mind is a really, really good book. I, I was just uh, chatting here with Ian that Jack Morin has another book that's very popular, too, which you want to share. On anal pleasure. Yes. Yeah. And I think that 
Um, in your book, uh, She Comes First, you have a lot of very specific details about another sex act. Yes, well, in She Comes First, written 10 years ago, I was dealing with um, a crisis in this country that was epidemic at the time, which was the illiteracy. High, high rates of illiteracy <laughs> in this country. And uh, I went around the country and found that most men knew more about what was under the hood of a car than the hood of a clitoris. And so uh, um, I decided to write a book called She Comes First that kind of broke out of what I called the intercourse discourse and this one way we think that sort of sex has to happen and sort of went from intercourse to kind of outer course and sort of helped men take a sort of non-intercourse-based approach to understanding female sexuality. Well, you give very specifics about exactly what they should be doing with... Very specific. You wrote I, a book about pussy licking. <laughs> <laughs> there and you the only go. Reason, really good. You should read it if you're interested. And the only reason why I'm mentioning that and mentioning Jack Moran's other book is because I think that part of what can happen as people develop in their lives is that they can allow their bodies to, to experience pleasure in ways that may be new to them. Because people uh, are, may be inhibited about various aspects of sex or about their bodies, and if they're having issues with desire, if they're feeling that their passion is lost, maybe some of it is just experiencing their bodies in new ways. Well, also in She Comes First, I was very upfront about my own struggles with sexual dysfunction, and everybody to some degree struggles with their own variation or their own inner sense of maybe feeling deviant in some ways mm -hmm. or crippled in some ways, and, um, and what was liberating for me was getting outside of this fixed idea that sex has to look one way mm -hmm. and developing a sex script that really played to my strengths and allowed me mm -hmm. to connect with my partner. And so I work a lot with couples on sort of deconstructing the problematic sex they're having to really develop new sex scripts that work to their strengths. Mm -hmm. And I, I, the concept of changing the sex script is, is really key. The, so I don't know why this comes as a surprise to so many of my students in particular. College age people are astonished at the idea that you're allowed to do anything you want with a consenting partner. You can put your tongue anywhere they're interested in you putting your tongue. Literally, you're allowed to do anything that both of you or all of you are like, yeah, all right. There aren't rules about what you actually should be doing. My ch so I made it rhyme so that you would remember and tell all your friends. Pleasure is the measure of sexual well-being. You know, so there's a sex therapist in New Jersey, her name is Christina Hyde, and uh, she uses this metaphor. So if you get invited to a party by a really good friend, you're like, of course I'll go to your party, you're my really good friend. And as the date gets closer, you're like, I'm gonna have to find childcare, and there's gonna be all this traffic, I have to put on pants on a Friday. <laughs> I don't know if I wanna do this, but you go because it's your friend, and you said you would go to the party. And what happens? You have a great time at the party. If you are having fun at the party, you are doing it right. That is the only thing that matters. Thank you all. Let's open it up for questions. Go ahead and raise your hands. Uh, anyone who has any questions for our distinguished panel? Um, yes, the woman Very brave. here. Um, where are you? She's down on this side with a scarf. Do you want to stand up? And then the microphone person. Is your question for a specific panelist? Thank you. No. Okay. Anyone who wants to respond. Um, so um, all men masturbate. Um, I don't think all women do. Uh, do you? Would you uh, encourage or think that there is a need to educate women so that they know better their bodies? Because I've read a lot about sex, and I, I do think that there is a um, women are, are not encouraged to know their bodies, and I think that's something that will help them because uh, they don't have, has, uh, men always have orgasm, but not all women do. So is that something that should be encouraged or should be educating our society, even if, if it's taboo, so that uh, men and women have 
better sex. Thank mm -hmm. you. So let's address this orga vote, yes. the <laughs> orgasmic, the orgasmic divide between men and women. Yeah, but th why don't you talk to it's that, Emily? It's just what you were Jump saying, in, that like <laughs> knowing your own body, being able to check in with your own internal experience. Um, so one of the big moments I had as a sex educator, my very first semester being trained, my teacher, her name was Annie Lomax, uh, said, so when you get home, everybody, what you're going to do is you're going to get a little hand mirror and you're going to go look at your clitoris. And so I did. It had never, I was 18 years old, it had never crossed my mind to do this. And I had been masturbating, and one of the few people, um, no, it's not few, it's, it's some 20 or 30 percent of girls remember masturbating before puberty. So I had contact with my genitals, but I had never looked, and I did, and it made me cry because of how ordinary my vulva was. It was just a part of my body, like my elbows and the bottoms of my feet. Why had I never looked at it before? But it set the stage. This was 20 years ago now. It set the stage for coming back over and over and over again to the idea that these real, like I read all the science and like all the things, but the place that I'm going to know what's right for my sexuality is what's going on inside my body. We can look out in the world all we want to for answers, but ultimately what it comes down to is what's going on inside your own body. And you can't know that unless you know how to quiet the external stuff and really tune into what's happening. I am actively pro-masturbation, especially for younger girls, sort of high school -y age, because before you start having sexual contact with a partner, if you know what pleasure feels like inside your own body, then when you get to be with a partner and they're doing things to you and they say, do you like this, you will know the answer to that question. Pleasure is not straightforward and obvious. We've all had the, okay, so tickling is the standard example, right? You can imagine yeah. a situation where uh, you're feeling like sexy and playful and fun and you're certain special someone tickles you, right? And that can feel good. Not everyone loves tickling, but hypothetically it could lead to more nookie. But if that exact same certain special someone tries to tickle you while you are pissed off at them, how does that feel? You want to punch them in the face. Right? It's exactly the same sensation, but because it happens in a different context, your perception of that sensation is totally opposite. Pleasure is not simple and obvious, but if you don't even know what pleasure feels like when you're on your own, there's no way in the much more complex setting of having a partner where you're like, you want to please your partner and say, yes, I like what you are doing, sure. And if you don't know what pleasure feels like in your body, when they ask, hey, do you like this? You'd be like, sure. I guess, I don't know what pleasure feels like because it's too complicated. So yes, I am pro-masturbation. Pro-masturbation and perhaps the best Valentine's gift would not be candies or flowers. It would be giving her a hand mirror and a flashlight. <laughs> I, I would say, like, if your partner has a vulva, get, like, a light and look and tell that person all the things that you love about their genitals. Look together. Yeah. Robin. Did you want to speak to this? Well, I just, um, as the layperson on the panel, I just vote yes for masturbation. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, especially for women, I think it's um, in, an imperative way for women to learn about their own bodies before they try to communicate that to someone else. Um, we have a huge problem with it in, in this society. And, um, you know, once we're adults, we all get to do what we want. And, you know, I think everyone in this room is an adult. And I, I just, I think we should do it a lot more often. And if you want to be having more sex in your relationship than your partner wants, if you're masturbating next to your partner in bed, which Ian had mentioned, then that sometimes bridges the gap in the high desire, low desire, high interest, low interest couple. Okay, more questions. Um, down front here. Hi, this is for Robin. Hi, Alex what? Jameson. I interviewed you when Hi, your book Alex. came out on my podcast. I remember. And I would love if you could talk more about what you referenced before, uh, becoming more comfortable in your body as you age and the relationship between body confidence and your sexuality. Yeah, I mean, I just... Uh, specifically, how have you come to... Like, how have you made amends with that? How's it going? Oh, what it's have you in tried? No, it's in process, and here's why. It's always changing. Right? So this year I'm 51, but next year I'll be 52, and last year if I was lucky. 50. And, right. Mm -hmm. And so, and then women, you know, get pregnant and have a child, and then their body changes from that, and, and not just women, men too. So it's ongoing. It's not like it's a happy ending. I haven't worked it out. In fact, it's a new challenge every day. 
So it's something that I think all women are working on. Teenagers are working on it probably harder than the rest of us because of being teenagers. All the way up to, I would think, you know, when you turn 90 and become enlightened and there are women who are 90 are probably working on it too. So I just think it's ongoing. And it, it, it comes down to just being gentle with yourself, just, just having compassion for yourself and just really letting go, uh, trying to let go. It's not easy. It's a constant struggle of the cultural messages about what a woman should look like as she ages. Um, you know, we see it everywhere, Botox and, you know, airbrushing and it's, you know, and that's, most of us don't see that when we look in the mirror. Mm -hmm. So, Can you I know, you have to make friends with your own body kind of newly every day. The, uh, so one of the things I talk about in my book, there's an evidence-based practice for improving body self-confidence and body image, which is that you look in a mirror wearing as few clothes as you can tolerate looking mm. at yourself in a mirror and you write down everything you see that you like. And of course, the first thing that happens is your brain floods with all the random bullshit, culturally constructed ideals of what your body is supposed to be. Yeah. That's fine. It's a cognitive dissonance exercise. If it's your eyelashes and your toenails, write that down. And you do that again and again. And as you do that, the things you like will become increasingly salient. And you'll be better and more aware of how bullshit all that other stuff was, and actually your round belly is gorgeous and your round thighs are gorgeous and your breasts are gorgeous exactly the way they are. Um, and what the research shows is that in that in combination with media literacy, just stop looking at the stuff that makes you feel like shit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the and luckily as you age difference. and get frumpier, you also do tend to start giving a shit less. So it kind of <laughs> works. Okay, uh, did you have the question down here? I'm so glad, uh, this question is for everyone, but I'm very glad that you brought up that tickling metaphor because mm. my question is about anger. Mm. I work um, a little bit with couples and my question is about what do you suggest when anger exists, especially in a marriage or, or long, a long-term relationship. It seems that the men are always kind of willing to like bang it out. Having sex is somehow consistent with almost every emotion. It doesn't matter. I don't mean to generalize grossly, but women <laughs> seem to, it, it's a block. Do you guys recommend compartmentalizing? Because some couples can't wait until they've cleared up all their issues together to have sex again. Mm -hmm. So no matter either the, the man or the wife or both women or both men, whatever the combination, if one is angry, what do they do to get past Well, it? I'll just say very quickly, and then I'd love yeah. to hear from uh, the experts yeah. on this. Uh, the, I used to think that I had to talk everything out um, with my partner uh, and get to like a complete level of stabilization and calm and everything is roses and unicorns again before we could have sex. But I found that, and, and it's true that if there's a huge issue working, I mean, that has to be worked out. But I found that in the course of normal daily life, a little bit of anger taken to bed isn't so bad. Like, sex can get a little aggressive or you know, you can get, you can make sounds and, you know, like... Use it, that it, anger. Yeah, you can saying. use it. And actually, you know, if you both realize anger is one normal emotion that happens in daily life in a, in a couple, there's nothing wrong, I don't think, with taking a little bit of it to bed with you and working it out there. But at the same time, I think it's a matter of degree. Ian, what do you advise the couples you work um, with? Well, you know, one thought that I had is I was thinking again about the work of uh, John Gottman, who is a... Uh, couples therapist and relationship researcher out in Seattle. And he, he spent a lot of time looking at uh, what makes some couples succeed and, and others fail. And, and the one takeaway was that the couples who seemed to succeed uh, had a higher ratio of positive to negative interactions. Um, even when they were arguing, even when they were fighting, even when they were mad at each other, there, there still managed to be a, uh, a spirit and a foundation of um, positivity. And so 
I, I try and get couples sort of tuned into that kind of positive approach that of course you're going to fight, of course you're going to be angry. I mean, it would be abnormal to, to not experience those things. But you can do so from a place of positivity. And I think Gottman actually said that the, the, the ideal ratio of positive to negative interactions was five to one. So for every sort of negative interaction you had with your partner, you'd have five positive ones to balance it. And somehow I think that sex, even when you're a little angry, that's like 25 positive interactions <laughs> in my book. So okay. I think that uh, it can be a nice big boost of um, positivity. Let's take another question or two. We'll see how we do for time. Yep. Emily mentioned um, responsive desire. Uh, spontaneity wears down in long-term relationships. So what the responsive, how uh, is it uh, something that you can do about, you can uh, go to practice, to specialist, or is it wired? So responsive desire is one, a normal way to experience desire. Uh, two, uh, almost everyone will experience both at different times in their lives. The typical narrative is that the hot and heavy fallen in love part of a relationship. Uh, the emotional fire of the love is sort of spreading over into the sex, so it sort of really easily lights up the sex fire, so sex feels very spontaneous. Um, the really super secret trick is that even spontaneous desire isn't actually spontaneous. It's just low threshold, like the fire is already burning hot in your emotional brain, and so it's easy for uh, the sex fire to light. Whereas like, when that burns down to a smolder, it takes extra bellows <laughs> to make that burst to life. So it's the same basic mechanism functioning in a different context, which means that you have control over it if you can control the aspects of the context that can stoke the fire, right? And that's gonna vary from partnership to partnership. For some people, increasing novelty, and what the research really shows over and over is that increasing novelty helps, increasing trust and going deep into fantasies like Ian has been talking about uh, is a way to increase, to like stoke the fire. Some couples do find that opening, when I was in Portland, I went to Portland, Oregon to do a reading and I stumbled into a group of swingers randomly. They're like, oh, let us fly you Bloody Mary, we'll go have brunch. And for this group of people, Opening up their relationships to having sex with other partners, watching their partners have sex with other people was like a game changer. They're all middle-aged and had previously had sort of like regular monogamous marriages and swinging was the thing for them, which is not gonna be right for everybody. Um, one of the phrases in my book I use is you do you. Whatever it is that works for you, do that thing. Like, if, if you like it, do it right. And if something doesn't work for you, try something else. Again, there aren't any rules. So responsive desire is normal, and you can maximize spontaneous desire by experimenting with the context and finding out what lights the spark. I, I do want to say it's very useful when you can sit down with a man and explain the difference between spontaneous desire mm -hmm. and what it feels like for a single sexual cue mm -hmm. to light you up and ignite the arousal platform, and then you can explain responsive desire and how it's about creating a context of multiple sexual cues. And you sit down with a guy and you sort of say, well, are you doing anything to sort <laughs> of create this co responsive context of sex cues? And it really gets a guy thinking and he starts to say, oh yeah, well, maybe now it makes sense that like, I shouldn't be so angry that she's not initiating the way I initiate. So I have found that just explaining the models to people goes a long way. Mm -hmm. Let's take one last question. Let's see who has a, our final question. Hello. Um, anyone can answer this, but uh, Ian, you were talking about psychological stimulation leading to physical desire. Um, I edit sex and relationships at Cosmo. We do write about exciting sex, but we write about a lot of different kinds of sex. But a lot of um, readers ask us, I, uh, you know, they fantasize, they fantasize about Channing Tatum, say, or somebody that's not necessarily their long-term boyfriend or husband, and they feel that they're some way um, breaking the rules by fantasizing about somebody who's not the person in front of them, and I see that in a lot of long-term relationships. So what would you say to those? We hear yeah, from a lot of women. I don't, yeah, I don't think it happens of, with uh, men. <laughs> it, it, it's sad to me that people, so many people have guilt and, and shame around their fantasy lives, and uh, 
Uh, I, I work with a lot of uh, couples and I talk to a lot of women and I've read some studies that show that, you know, fantasy, especially for women, is uh, a, a really important process that's happening even during sex. And a lot of women are fantasizing often about somebody other than the person they're actually having sex with and will beat themselves up about that. You know, I, I think, you know, for the brain to sort of calm itself and relax itself, and especially for a woman to maybe get into the kind of state of relaxation and deactivation that she may need to become aroused and have an orgasm, that, you know, there's a lot of outside stressors outside of that bedroom. There's kids, there's chores, there's money problems, there's work problems, there's family problems. How do you turn off all of that noise? And I think one of the ways the brain sort of naturally does this is to fantasize, is to create arousing um, images that are more arousing than what's happening outside of the bedroom. And so I think that's part of the power of fantasy and part of the power of fantasizing about somebody who's not your partner because that's a taboo and that's something that you're not really going to maybe go and do out in your life unless... <laughs> Robin Tatum over here. Um, Only for a year. I'm Only done. For, um, <laughs> And so it's a, it's a chance to um, explore those taboos that we probably, most of us, won't go out and explore in our actual lives. Any final thoughts about passion in people's lives and rekindling the flame? I'm going to quote an artist this time. Okay. Um, so Dorothy Sayers was a Christian scholar and an author of uh, British mystery novels. Um, and she had her, her uh, detective, Peter Whimsey, say, the worst, perhaps the only sin that passion can commit is to be joyless. It must lie down with laughter or make its bed in hell. There can be no middle way. It is the pleasure we experience with our partner, the capacity to laugh. Did you know that when you laugh, the muscles of your pelvic floor, right around the mouth of the vagina and the urethra, pulse rhythmically? If you laugh during intercourse, you can feel it in your partner's body. I really recommend So remember that it's about joy of enjoying the experience, laugh while you're fucking. <laughs> That's a beautiful note. That's a great ending. Thank you very much, <laughs> Emily, Ian, and Robin. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'd like to thank all our speakers.